his memoirs. Would you open your Bible to Acts chapter 1? I just want to read a couple of verses to set our minds. There's, there's actually, I mean, there's so many themes that we could study in the life of Robert Murray McChain. Uh, probably the primary one that most people talk about is his holiness for, for good reason. Um, but this morning, I, I just want to take one look at kind of a practical aspect of his life. We're, we're going to do kind of a, a study of his life first, a biography of him, and then we'll look specifically at the area of prayer. Uh, Robert Murray McChain as a paradigm, uh, a man of prayer. And so I just want to show you in the book of Acts where this is relevant uh, to our coming study. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Luke writes, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. This is after uh, Jesus has just ascended, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, different Judas. And all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The very first thing that the believers do when Jesus leaves is they pray. Then look at Acts chapter 2 verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers on the day of the birth of the church. When 3,000 are saved through Peter's preaching, the very first thing they do is they get together to hear the teaching, to have fellowship, to do communion, and to pray. And then look at Acts chapter 6. There's a crisis in the church, one of the first crises inside of the church. And there's a call for the apostles to fix it. And they say, Acts chapter 6, verse 4, but we will devote, same word, ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then just go back a couple chapters, Acts chapter 4, verse 31 when the church first encounters persecution, what do they do? They gather together and they pray through Acts chapter, through Psalm chapter 2. And then it says this, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The point that I want you to draw from this is that Christ's sheep, his lambs, have always known him by prayer. From the very beginning of the church to today, in our services and in our gatherings, literally what we were just doing, and in the early 1800s in Scotland, in a church in Dundee, the church has always been marked by a knowledge of Christ that comes through the word and through prayer. Prayer is what animated God's choice servant, Robert Murray McChain, in his potent short life and ministry, and it must animate us today. When I say short, I mean Robert Murray McChain was born in 1813 and he died in 1843. He was 29 when he passed away. He preached under 200 sermons in the entirety of his life. And yet he is remembered today as a man of almost matchless holiness and dedication to prayer in that short life. And so I want to ask why. What was it about Robert Murray McChain and his view of prayer and how he thought about himself? Sorry, that's like really washed out and whatever. It's just that he actually was a, an artist a little bit. He drew himself. That's a picture he drew of himself. And we're going to look at um, his life in just those handful of headings. When I find out what was it about this man that so drew him to the Lord in prayer and so animated his ministry such that he would preside over one of the greatest revivals in Scottish history for just a, a few short years. And I, I think the answer is earnest prayer. And I hope to show you that. Robert Murray McChain was born in 
Edinburgh on May 21st, 1813. He was the youngest of five children. His eldest brother, this David, was a devout Christian, just eight or nine years older than him. His parents, Adam and Lockhart, uh, were Christians. Uh, they were wealthy. They lived in a large mansion. They had servants. Uh, they worked for the government there in Edinburgh, always overshadowed by the castle. And they were Christians, but they were what was known at the time as moderate Christians. It was the kind of Christianity that had been influenced very heavily by the Enlightenment. And so there's very low view of sin. Sin was just kind of a mistake that you did. Uh, there was very low view of God. God really was just the guy who helped you out to do the things you wanted to do. Uh, really, most of what happened in the pulpit growing up for Robert Murray McChain was very long sermons that were filled with essentially nothing. They were kind of just scholarly treatises or reflections that really had nothing to do with the Bible, had very little to do with Christ. There was no calling of people to conversion. There was none of that. It was moderate Scottish Christianity at the time. But Robert, from a very young age, took very quickly to the things of the Bible. When he was four, he started memorizing the Greek alphabet just for fun while he was sick so that he could read the Bible in Greek. He had a knack for recitation, for singing, for writing poetry. Uh, he writes later that he was an obedient child, that he was moral from all outward perspectives. He really was a very good kid. People looked at him and thought, well, this, this kid is like a Christian. Certainly he must be a Christian. And yet, he wouldn't become a Christian until he was 18 years old. He started what they called then high school at the age of eight. Uh, it was actually kind of like our current high school curriculum, but they were just more rigorous back then. That's what they did. And he was bright, he was well-liked, he was apparently very tall and handsome. When people looked at him, they, they called him winsome and lovely. Uh, he was, because of his attractiveness, very well-liked. He was popular in the social scene. He would go, uh, in their day, what they would do is they would go to uh, social gatherings where they would play cards or they would dance. Those were basically the two big things they would do in Scotland in his day. And so he was all about the party scene. Uh, but he was a moral kid. Uh, he also very much liked walking in nature. Uh, he liked to observe nature scenes. He was kind of a poetic soul, and so he would write poetry even from a young age. And then he went to the University of Edinburgh at age 14, which, you know, lock that in your mind, going to college when you're 14, uh, which is not unusual for his day. It's just what he did. And he graduated four years later in 1831. In the year 1831, when he was 18, was a seminal year in the life of Robert Murray McChain because his older brother, David, died. David was a devout Christian, very unlike the rest of his family, very unlike the rest of his church. He sought the Lord earnestly, and he pled with his younger brother, Robert, to come to Christ, to see the depth of his sin, and to know and to love this Jesus who had died for him. And then his health started to deteriorate, he became very distraught. And then in the very last days of David's life, the Lord just infused him with a kind of peace and evangelical eloquence that allowed him to pronounce upon all of his family these blessings of the gospel. And that ultimately is what led to Robert's conversion, was seeing his brother pass away. He wrote about it often. He wrote several poems about his brother passing away. Eleven years after the fact, he was still celebrating the anniversary of his brother's death. He thought often of his brother dying as, as the first person who really cared about his soul. The first person to ask him if he knew Christ. It's kind of along with this and reading a book called The Sum of Saving Knowledge that he was converted. And immediately upon his conversion at the age of 18, he had a deep contrition. One of the things that you'll find if you read much of Robert Roy McChain is that he thought a lot about his sin. Not to the detriment of his thinking about Christ, but so that he could think higher thoughts of Christ. He had an incredibly dark view of his own sin and a high view of Christ. For the first time, his friend Andrew Bonner writes, he, quote, began to seek God to his soul. And that started a kind of gradual movement in his life away from worldliness. What he saw 
as the world scene, the playing cards, the going to parties and dances, all of that he started to see as just frivolous and meaningless. And another thing you pick up if you read McChain is just this utter desire to capture every last second for the sake of Christ. He wrote often from Ephesians 5 to redeem the time and lamented hours, wasted hours, not just going to sinful events, but even when he would have just a conversation that wasn't about Jesus. <laughs> he said, it, it, it didn't profit anyone eternally, so woe is me. <laughs> Andrew Bonner's friend wrote, quote, to us who can look at the results, it appears probable that the Lord permitted him thus to try many broken cisterns and to taste the wormwood of many earthly streams in order that in after days, by the side of the fountain of living waters, he might point to the world he had forever left and testify to the surpassing preciousness of what he had now found. What he's saying there is, I mean, maybe this is the case for some of you. If if you were saved later in life or if you came to Christ after a life of worldliness, it's not meaningless. The Lord uses that so that you can point to that previous life and say, look how vain that was <laughs> and look how worthy Christ is. Later, McChain wrote a poem about his conversion. I'll read it to you. It's called Jehovah Sidkenu, which is, he was kind of a, a wizard in Hebrew. And so, uh, Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord of Righteousness. Here's what he says. I'll put it on the screen. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. The friend spoken rapture of Christ on the tree, Jehovah Sidkenu, was nothing to me. I oft read with pleasure to soothe or engage Isaiah's wild measure and John's simple page. But even when they pictured the blood-sprinkled tree, Jehovah Sidkenu seemed nothing to me. Like tears from the daughters of Zion that roll, I wept when the waters went over his soul, yet thought not that my sins had nailed to the tree, Jehovah said Kenu. It was nothing to me. Even here, there, he was crying, weeping even about his experience with religion, and yet it still had not pierced his heart. But when free grace, free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fears shook me. I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could I see. Jehovah said, Cainy, my Savior must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fears banished with boldness I came to drink at the fountain, life-giving and free. Jehovah said, Cainy, is all things to me. Jehovah said, Cainy, my treasure and boast. Jehovah said, Cainy, I ne'er can be lost. In thee I shall conquer by flood and by field. My cable, my anchor, my breastplate and shield. Even when treading the valley, the shadow of death, this washword shall rally my faltering breath. For while from life's fever, my God sets me free. Jehovah said Kenu, my death song shall be. That's a particularly potent last line there because it was around this time in his life that he began to develop the sickness that would eventually take his life. Several fevers, uh, it was a typhus. One of his lungs just completely shut down, wasn't working at all for most of his adult life. And so after his conversion in that summer, he decided he could no longer go into politics or to law or into writing about the classics, which he loved to do. And instead, he would go into the ministry. And so he joined the Divinity Hall at the University of Edinburgh, actually the same grounds uh, there in Edinburgh. He excelled, like I said, in the biblical languages. He learned Hebrew uh, very well, which is kind of rare in his day. He was very strongly influenced by the writings of Jonathan Edwards and one of his professors, Sir Thomas Chalmers. And if you're familiar with that name, it's probably because you've heard the quote from Thomas Chalmers uh, that it is only uh, a... I'm blanking on the quote. The expulsive power of a new affection. Uh, that was Thomas Chalmers' whole vibe in ministry was that it wasn't just that you said no to sin. You had to see something glorious and wonderful in order to say yes to that, to say no to sin. And that was very much uh, his influence on McChain. He also taught him a number of principles that followed him for the rest of his life in ministry. One was called the aggressive principle. principle. Uh, what they would do is go out into the neighborhoods and just knock randomly on doors and sit down with people for about an hour or two hours and ask them about their soul. 
uh, basically however long they would let them. Uh, they just did door-to-door evangelism, basically is what it was, in their neighborhoods, just constantly asking people. And, and he would do this for the rest of his life. Even while he was pastoring a church of about 1,100 people, uh, even while he was traveling all over the world and itinerant preaching, he would make it his regular weekly business to go around door-to-door and knock and see if anyone in there was a Christian. If they were, he would catechize them. If they weren't, he would preach the gospel to them. That was a very normal part of his life and of the life of his friends. He developed two very close friends at this time, Alexander Somerville and Andrew Bonner, who would write, later write about his life. They were very, very much inseparable. And McChain said this about what he was learning from Thomas Chalmers at this point in his life. Quote, when you gaze upon the sun, it makes everything else tasteless. So when you taste honey, it makes everything else tasteless too. So when your soul feeds on Jesus, it takes away the sweetness of all earthly things. Praise, pleasure, fleshly lust, all lose their sweetness. Keep a continued gaze. Run looking into Jesus. Look to the way of salvation by Jesus. Fills up the whole horizon. So glorious and peace speaking. So will the world be crucified to you and you unto the world. And just to give you kind of a sample of what his memoir sounded like, this is what he wrote on September 2nd, the Sabbath evening. Sabbath was just his way of talking about Sunday. Reading, too much engrossed and too little devotional. Preparation for a fall. Warning, we may be too engrossed with the shell even of heavenly things. He was reading his material for class, uh, Christian books about Jesus, And in his mind, it was not devotional enough in his heart. And he said that that was setting him up for a fall. During this time, he also very heavily considered missionary work. For the rest of his life, he wondered whether or not he should be a missionary. And he was very concerned about his own motives in that. Why did he want to be a missionary? He writes, even in his own memoirs, that he was concerned that he wanted to be a missionary for the romance of the thing. (laughs) Because uh, missionaries in that day would go away and they would come back and they would write kind of the story of their travels and they would get published widely and everyone would ooh and ah uh, at the exotic life that they had led. And so he thought, do I just want to be a kind of Christian celebrity or, or do I actually care about souls? He said, souls are as precious here as they are in Burma. Do I love them as much? Or do I just love praise? Eventually, he finished seminary and was licensed to preach in the summer of 1835 at the age of 22. Andrew Bonner writes about this time in his life, quote, His soul was prepared for the awful work of the ministry by much prayer and much study of the Word of God, by affliction in his person, by inward trials and sore temptation, by experience of the depth of his own corruption, of his own heart, and by discoveries of the Savior's fullness of grace. After he had gone through his ordination process, he was asked to be an assistant pastor of a kind of dual parish of Larbert and Dunipis, which was kind of a a city area and a country area with two major churches in them uh, being pastored by a guy named John Bonner, no relation to his friend. And he took to it very well. Uh, It was a coveted kind of position for those who were coming out of the Divinity Hall. Uh, There were his friends, Andrew and Alexander Somerville, very much wanted that position, but they weren't asked (laughs) And so he had this job for basically a year. And what he would do is on one Sunday, he would be in one of the congregations. The other Sunday, he would be in the other. And he would preach three times that Sunday. Once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once at night. And he very much decided that he wanted to preach uh, shorter sermons because he'd grown up with these very long, boring sermons. So he wanted to get to the point and preach short. Which I, could, I could take a page out of his book. That'd be helpful. Uh, he began here formal visitation. So there's about 6,000 people in these areas and he would just go door to door and take notes about all of his interactions with the people there. So there's just an extraordinary amount of material of him just talking about his interactions with people inside of their homes uh, and very straightforward with people. There's one instance where um, a family was about to lose their baby. Their baby was sick and they asked him to do some kind of Catholic rites for the baby to save it. And he just said, no, I won't. And then he preached the gospel to them and he said, if you think that that's going to save someone, then you're going to hell. I mean, these people are about to lose their kid. And he's like telling them, 
hard truth. It, he, he would go on to say later in his ministry that it is he who loves most who preaches about hell the most. Because he really believed in the sovereignty and the righteousness of God. It was during this time that he really developed as a preacher. He had started out by writing out his manuscript full sentences and everything. And then while he was actually on his pony uh, to go preach at the other congregation, his pony's name was Tully, uh, he lost his notes. They fell off <laughs> and he couldn't get them back. And so he just had to show up with the Bible in his hand and preach. And he found out he could do that. <laughs> he didn't realize that he could. Uh, and from that point forward, basically, he was an extemporaneous preacher, meaning he basically didn't use notes. He would write an outline the night before, memorize it, and then just go into the pulpit with his Bible and preach. He was obviously uniquely gifted to do that. He preached with incredible gentleness, tenderness. He often said that the gospel must not only be the content of our preaching, but also the tone of our preaching. Such that when his friend Andrew Bonner one day, who was serving in a, another congregation nearby, uh, and him were talking, he asked Andrew, what did you just preach on this Sunday? And Andrew told him, I preached on hell and judgment. And McChain's answer was, yes, but did you do it tenderly? Hmm. Often you see in his memoirs how much he hated that he loved man's approval. He said this, quote, I see a man cannot be a faithful minister until he preaches Christ for Christ's sake, until he gives up striving to attract people to himself and seeks only to attract them to Christ. Lord, give me this. After just this one year, in 1836, he was called to the pastorate where he would spend the rest of his life, which is only six more years, in Dundee. Dundee was a seaside town, uh, kind of rough, not a lot of Christians there, but they were starting a new church and they needed a pastor. It was going to be a, a well-regarded pastorate, and so it was dearly sought after by him and all of his other friends. And it was kind of known by everyone that there was this competition for who would be the pastor there. And he said some very humble things about his other friends, but eventually he won out and his other friends said he was the right man for the job. So he took his pastorate when he was 23 years old. How many of you guys are 23 right now? Or, yeah. So the, he was Keenan and he took his pastorate. His very first sermon he preached was Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, the spirit of the Lord is on me to pro proclaim good news to the captives. And he preached that every year on that same date as a remembrance of his installation. The church building there in Dundee seated about 1,100 people. And from the very first day, it was packed every Sunday. This is kind of like the size of our, our uh, auditorium in there. Packed every Sunday. There are about 4,000 people in this parish. It was a poor area. And a lot of people were very ill all the time. There was a flu epidemic that was sweeping through Scotland during this time. And he didn't care. He just kept going to people's houses and ministering to them and catechizing them. He'd be coughing in his face, vomiting up blood, and he'd hand them a, a handkerchief and tell them the gospel. <laughs> McChain preached Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. He started a Thursday night prayer meeting. He started a Tuesday night and a Monday night meeting to catechize children and teenagers. He started a Saturday morning meeting for his elders. His preaching emphasized conversion and holiness. He was very evangelistic, as you can imagine, as a preacher. He talked often about hell and often about judgment and often about the righteousness of God. He was constantly vindicating the righteousness of God, that God is good to condemn sinners, that it is the right thing for God to do to judge us and send us to hell. But it is the free gift of God. It is the grace of God. It is the unmerited love of God that allows us to come in he had an incredible holiness of life. He was so separate from the world in so many ways. And his holiness was just eminent in his winsome, gentle, tender tone to the degree that people would say when he mounted the pulpit, before he even said a word, you could hear weeping. It was people just looking at him were so aware of his weighty holiness that he had been with the Lord 
John Shearer writes, quote, this is a contemporary of his, but McShane was himself his greatest sermon. And here is the secret of his success. He walked with God in the beauty of holiness. Our Lord's presence seemed to envelop him, diffusing a heavenly aroma. His very manner, his bearing as if a man standing in God's presence was often the means of awakening indifferent sinners so that men who could not remember a word he said found themselves with an unforgettable impression that God had drawn very near to them. And in 1839, as he continued to preach and minister in Dundee, his health started to worsen. And so he retreated to his parents' house back in Edinburgh, where his sister and his parents took care of him. And he wrote many letters to his congregation, which are still kept today and are, are dear letters. And it was around this time that the Church of Scotland decided that they wanted to mount a mission to see how the Jewish people were doing in Palestine. There was kind of an interest in that day in millenarianism, uh, a kind of uh, idea that Christ would be coming back any moment, so we need to figure out what's going on with the Jewish nation. And so the Church of Scotland said, we want to mount a mission there. We, we got to select the best men. So they selected four men, and two of them were McChain and Bonner. In fact, actually, they didn't want to take Bonner, but McChain convinced them to. Uh, Andrew Bonner, his friend, was, was kind of... Um, cantankerous about the millennium. He was a premillennialist, and there weren't any at the time. <laughs> and so they didn't want to take him. Everyone else is on mill and they're like, no, we don't want that guy coming with us. He's just going to talk about the millennium the whole time. Uh, but McChain convinced him. And so they went on just this epic journey. Weirdly, his physicians at the time said it was a good idea. <laughs> he could barely breathe at various points, but um, I guess that was the medical wisdom of the day, if you just get to fresher air or something. <laughs> so they said, yeah, you should go on this long, arduous journey. Uh, shortly before leaving, McChain wrote this, quote, I sometimes think that a great blessing may come to my people in their absence. Often God does not bless us in the midst of our labors, lest we shall say my hand and my eloquence have done it. Which, as you'll find out, turned out to be prophetic. McChain at this time appointed a man, William Chalmers Burns, to be his interim pastor while he went away on this mission. William Chalmers Burns was kind of a farmhand, not much to look at, not much to talk about. He ended up being a missionary in, in China, but at this point in time, he was a, a pastor's kid. His dad was a pastor in Kilsyth nearby, and he could talk about the Bible, but he really wasn't much of an order, but he loved the Lord, and McChain loved him, and so he put him in the pastorate there. Eventually, they left by horse. They took a steamboat down to Palestine, actually down to Egypt, and they went up to Palestine, and they went through the Balkan states back. And it was kind of a dangerous journey. At various points, they would have to ride camels through the desert to, for days on end without water. Uh, at, at one point, he was assaulted by shepherds, robbers, basically, uh, who beat him up and left him for dead on the ground. And then Andrew Bonner happened to find him and bring him back to health. It was a dangerous journey, but they kind of loved it. Uh, everywhere they went, especially in Palestine, they wrote about all the sites that they would see, kind of like you and I would do today if we went on a, a Christian trip to Israel and you would have someone take you around. They didn't have anyone take them around, but they just knew their Bible so well. They were like, hey, here's where David fought Goliath, and here's Jerusalem, and here's these steps. And uh, there's an incredible spiritual experience for them. And they wrote a, a book that they titled, quote, Narrative of a Mission of Inquiry to the Jews from the Church of Scotland. That became a bestseller in the Church of Scotland at the time. And they very much enjoyed that trip and returned later that year. As they were returning, they got to Hamburg, Germany. And while they were there, they received news that something incredible was happening in Scotland. You remember they didn't have cell phones at this point in time, so they couldn't just text to hear about this. They just heard some rumblings that there was something big spiritually going on in Scotland. And it wasn't until they were on a ship back to England that they read a newspaper that told them revival had broken out in Scotland. But they didn't really know where. Until he got back to Edinburgh, which is just south of Dundee, and he heard from his parents, revival has broken out in your church. <laughs> hmm. While I was gone. <laughs> McChain would later say that that revival broke him of his idolatry of his church. What had happened was that William... Chalmers Burns 
had been asked to kind of guest preach at his dad's church in Kilsyth. And so he did. And it apparently wasn't all that good a sermon, but the Holy Spirit just fell on people. <laughs> and they started weeping and mourning. Hundreds and hundreds of people coming now. We, we need to be saved. Tell us more about Christ. And so they started doing services every night. And then eventually he had to go back to the church in Dundee. And he told them on a Thursday night prayer meeting everything that just happened. And then revival broke out there. <laughs> the Spirit fell and hundreds of people came forward weeping and asking to be saved. What shall I do to be saved? And they started holding church services every night. Uh, people who observed this said, it was like everyone left their work. The miller left the mill. The farmer left the farm so that they could all just go to church and hear more preaching. All they wanted to do was hear more from the Word of God and to bring their friends. It was said that almost the entire town of Dundee was saved. The whole culture was radically transformed. And McChain comes back to that. <laughs> Wisely, he, when he came back to his church, asked Burns to stay for a little while and to kind of co-preach with him. People just so grown to love him as the agent of this revival. And in deep humility, McChain said to Burns about this revival, quote, I have no desire but the salvation of my people by whatever instrument. He continued to serve his congregation then for three more years. His health worsened. He became somewhat famous in Scotland because of his involvement in this revival. He became an itinerant preacher. And in fact, that's kind of what he loved to do more than anything, was to travel around Scotland and preach in different churches. But as his health grew worse and he continued to preach, his eye was always on eternity. He always had a sense of the shortness of life. I, I don't think he knew that he would die at 29, but he certainly had a sense that life can be short. He knew a number of preachers who had died young, and he thought that might be him too. On February 1843, he went on an itinerant preaching tour through Scotland. He returned. He had a bout of typhus that was particularly bad. He preached his last sermon and then on March 25th, 1843, attended by a physician, Robert Roy McChain, unable to speak, raised his hands as if blessing his church one last time, and then fell asleep in the Lord. Probably his most famous quote, which is certainly emblematic of his life, quote, it is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. Just briefly, I, I want to remark on what McShane has to teach us about prayer. And I've, I have too many quotes here, so we'll, we'll just kind of breeze through this. But there are a lot of things you could say about his life and his vitality in ministry, where his power and his strength came from. But I think if, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, I think it would be his communion with God. That's very much how he saw prayer, as communion with God. He was a man of constant prayer, fervent prayer, regular prayer, bold prayer. Andrew Bonner said, quote, McShane dwelt at the mercy seat as if it were his home. He even saw these various bouts of illness that he had during his life where he'd be removed from ministry for a time. He saw those moments when he couldn't do anything else as the Lord teaching him to pray pressing him further into particularly intercessory prayer. He took prayer seriously, especially family devotion. That's why the um, Bible reading plan that we're doing here, it flowed out of this. In his mind, prayer and, and reading scripture were, were kind of one and the same. You, you read to hear from God and you pray to talk back to him. And so he took very seriously both family devotions and private prayer. Most days, he would rise at 6 or 6.30, pray for an hour or two hours, and then go about his work and then pray for another hour in the evening. On Sundays, the Sabbath, he called it the Lord's Day, he would pray throughout the day for a total of six hours. Remember, he also preached three sermons. <laughs> he said, quote, rose early to seek God and found him whom my soul loveth. Who would not rise early to meet such company? Someone asked him 
at one point in his life, why do you just torture yourself? You're already sick. Why are you getting up so early and staying up late praying? And he said, this life is short and hard. I ought to spend the best hours of the day in communion with God. It is my noblest and most fruitful employment and is not to be thrust into any corner. He went on to say, I ought to pray before seeing anyone. Often when I sleep long or meet with others early, it is 11 or 12 o'clock before I begin secret prayer. This is a wretched system. (laughs) It is unscriptural. Christ arose before day and went into a solitary place. David says, early will I seek thee. Thou shalt early hear my voice. Family prayer loses much of its power and sweetness, and I can do no good to those who come to seek from me. The conscience feels guilty, the soul unfed, the lamp not trimmed. Then when in secret prayer the soul is often out of tune, I feel it is far better to begin with God, to see his face first, to get my soul near him before it is near another. In terms of the content of his prayer, he kind of followed basically what you and I would think of as the Acts model of prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication is basically it, except he tacked on intercession to the end of that, just praying mostly for his congregation, but also for Scotland. He very much advocated secret, private prayer as the primary thing. He said, quote, I pray and labor for the deepest sense of my utter weakness and helplessness that ever a sinner was brought to feel. He wanted to be low before God in prayer in order that God might feel that much weightier and high. That's how he prayed. And let me just remark briefly on why he prayed and give you kind of three headings here. Here's the first reason, because prayer works. (laughs) He prayed because prayer works. This is what McChain himself said, prayer moves him that moves the universe. Prayer is not just talking into the air. It's not just Christian superstition. It is communing with and communicating with the God who works all things after the counsel of his will. McChain would say, God will either give you what you ask or something far better. (laughs) You never go into prayer in danger that you will ask the wrong thing because God will only ever do his good will for you. McChain said, quote, remember this is a man who preached almost every day of the week. Prayer is more powerful than preaching. He went on to say, quote, surely, see, uh, see how surely Christ's prayer will be answered for you, beloved. He does not plead that you are good and holy. He does not plead that you are worthy. He only pleads his own loveliness in the eyes of the Father. Look not on them, he says, but look on me. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So learn to use the same argument with God, dear believers. This is asking in Christ's name for the Lord's sake. This is the prayer that is never refused. Saying prayer is Trinitarian. That's why it works, because we come through Christ to the Father. Secondly, not only prayer works, but prayer sanctifies. He said this, quote, There is nothing a natural man hates more than prayer. Of course, especially extended prayer. (laughs) But for those who are in Christ, prayer is the dearest of companions because of how it changes us. He said this, quote, you will not find or have many companions. Be the more with God. He he often talked about how prayer would wean him away from the world, would cause him to love the things of this earth less. He said, quote, live near to God and all things will appear little to you in comparison with eternal realities. Or, quote, set not your heart on the flowers of this world, for they have all canker in them. Prize the rose of Sharon, a phrase from Song of Solomon, which he preached often. More than all, for he changeth not. Live nearer to Christ than to the saints, so that when they are taken from you, you may still have him to lean. And, quote, brethren, if you were ever so much taken up with any enjoyment that it takes away your love for prayer or for your Bible, then you are abusing this world. Oh, sit loose to this world's joy. The time is short. And lastly, he prayed because prayer is communion with Christ. Prayer communes with Christ. He would say, Christ is with us in prayer. 
That is where you get the sense of his presence. He would also say, quote, the soul enjoys great nearness to God, enters within the veil, and lies down at the feet of Jesus. Do you see how he thought about prayer is, is not as this list of things that I needed to tell God, as if he needed to be informed about something in my life. He saw this as communion, as a relationship, as coming before the throne as a son before a father so that he might talk with him and learn from him and enjoy just being with him in the same way that you enjoy being with each other and being with your family. He said, this is what the Christian gets in prayer, to be with God. He said, quote, I declare to you that I had rather be one hour with God than a thousand with the sweetest society on earth or in heaven. All other joys are but streams. God is the fountain. A calm hour with God is worth a whole lifetime with man. And when he prayed, he prayed in such an honest way, such a frank way, not just in public, but also in private. This is what he said. Quote, communion with Christ is always sanctifying. Oh, it is good for the soul to meet with Jesus. Oh, if you would go to Jesus and tell him all, if you would cause him to hear it, how it much happier lives you would lead. Let there be the utmost frankness between your soul and Christ. Cover no sin before him. Pour out every joy, unbosom every grief, seek counsel in every perplexity. He would go on to say that Christ complains that we speak more to one another than to him. That often it's the case that we run to our friends when we experience some joy or some trial in our life. That we run to the people around us. We want them to know. We want to tell them about it. But he says, no, run to Jesus first. Pray to him first. Let him know about it first. Unbosom your heart to him first. And finally he said, quote, the greatest joy, this is a statement, <laughs> the greatest joy of a believer in this world is to enjoy the presence of Christ. Not seen, not felt, not heard, but still real. The real presence of the unseen Savior, and it is this that makes secret prayer sweet. I ask you, do you want to taste and see that the Lord is good? Do you want to have a kind of vital spirituality about your life? Do you want to be the kind of person whose holiness is so emblematic it's spoken without a word? Do you wish that you could have the kind of spiritual talk and experience that you hear other people talking about, but you feel like, well, that could never be me. I'm just not that kind of person. Do you want to feel a deep sorrow for your sin, but instead when you look at your sin, you just feel coldness, indifference, whatever. Do you want to revel in the glories of Christ and who He is to us in the gospel? Do you want to drink deeply of the fountain of living water? Do you want your life to be characterized by this sweet communion with Jesus? Do you want to live on earth as if already in heaven? Then brothers and sisters, like our brother Robert before us, we must pray. Let's do that now. Righteous Lord, Holy Father, this is where we want to be. There is no greater joy than to be in your presence. Having heard from you in your word, 
to come to you as obedient children. As you command us through the Apostle Paul to always pray. God, we lay our lives before you. We open our hearts before you. We don't hide anything from you now. Lord Jesus, uncover the secrets in our hearts. Unmask us before you. Reveal who we are and what we love. And bend all of it toward you. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that avails for us to come through the curtain into the Holy of Holies to talk with you thus. And it is by his blood that we have such confidence and boldness and access to be precisely who we are before you. And yet we pray like McChain, Lord, do this in us. Change us. Do not let us stay the same. Don't let us go another week without applying sermons, without dedicating ourselves to prayer, without loving you. God, make the foundry, make Emmanuel Bible Church radiant with holiness, like Moses coming off of the mountain. And yet, may we, like McChain, ask to have a holy indifference to our shining because our eyes are so fixed on you. Would you make us a people of prayer? And do it for the sake of the worth of Christ, the glory of Christ, the praise of Christ. Christ is all and in all. And it is in his name that we pray this. Amen.